Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Crook. I'm the CTO of Call for Code, the global initiative, as well as uh, Code and Response, which is a program that we have at the Linux Foundation in partnership with IBM and uh, many other partners like the United Nations um, and sponsors like Slack, Arrow, uh, the CNCF, another Linux Foundation organization, and many other small and large partners. So I'm here today with uh, Derek Thier, my colleague. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about the code and response with the Linux Foundation uh, umbrella project. Uh, and we'll talk exactly how um, projects enter into that program, as well as how uh, developers uh, can take part in some of the projects that are there, or even uh, create new ones as part of the Call for Code competition. So I'm gonna start by talking about the Call for Code program. And this is, um, sorry, I just haven't let you, uh, slides, oops. Oh, there we go. Figured out the slides, sorry about that. Um, so let me talk first a bit about Call for Code. Um, and uh, Call for Code itself is something that IBM launched with the Linux Foundation as well as United Nations just over two years ago. And it's a partnership to not only be a five-year program, but also to host a, a yearly Tech for Good competition. And it's the largest uh, of its kind in terms of participation from developers around the world. And the goal with the competition every year is to create open source projects, sustainable projects that have a sponsor organization, the, the creating team normally, um, as well as an open source community around those projects so that they can make a difference immediately as well as long-term against some sort of uh, humanitarian issue. In the past two years, we focused on uh, what can technology do to mitigate the impact of natural disasters. And um, this year we've launched with a scope around climate change and COVID-19 solutions, which I'll get into a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but uh, the, the goal is that um, we inspire developers uh, over the course of about four months to learn about that important issue from experts, from organizations that know much about it, uh, what the real problems are, how technology might help, and how to measure their impact. So um, what we do with Call for Code is, is pair developers against those real world issues. Uh, for example, in the case of natural disasters, um, that would have been the Sendai framework that comes from the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Organization. And this year with climate change, it's focused around uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Now, the competition puts forward a theme, uh, a global challenge, and the five winning teams are recognized from the competition. All five get support from the Linux Foundation, um, help them implement their project as open source projects, uh, implement some best practices for how to run an open source uh, project, such as having a code of conduct, contribution guidelines, uh, as well as raising awareness through foundation events just like this one. Uh, so there's a cash prize, of course. Uh, there's that open source support from Linux Foundation. And then um, there's also, um, through the Code Response Program, folks have access to the IBM Service Core, a set of volunteers that can be drafted um, to fill in gaps on the submitting team. Uh, for example, if they need hardware experts, if they need software experts, user experience experts, uh, designers, branders, things like that. So the winners of the competition uh, win not only the, the competition, uh, they don't just go home, take their cash prize and go home. Uh, Code and Response with the Linux Foundation provides um, that way to ensure that every call for code winner has the ability to be deployed out in the field. So innovation coming from around the world and the support to make those ideas real. Um, so I've mentioned two programs so far, uh, and just to be clear about what those are, Call for Code is the competition, is the uh, yearly competition. Code and Response with the Linux Foundation is the project for incubating those ideas. So they come in from Call for Code, uh, for example, last two years grand prize winners, as well as some of the runners up, and uh, other interested program projects that are open source come in. We help them build out the solutions, matching them with the skills I, I mentioned earlier, as well as helping them achieve some non-functional goals, doing some security audits, helping them scale, things like that. 
Uh, we help test them. Um, uh, Derek will talk a little bit about uh, some of the extensive testing we did with the 2018 winner. Um, and then we help them graduate out by implementing their solution, kind of getting to a milestone where they're either a sustainable um, company, maybe they've got their first sale or first contract um, with some partner organization, um, or but they just generally have the ability to keep on uh, sustaining themselves as open source projects. So uh, as I mentioned, we are in our third year of Call for Code, the second year of Code and Response. Um, and um, the, the team that won the first year, they created a really interesting mesh network, an ad hoc mesh network that could restore network access after a natural disaster. Um, and it's really about quickly and cheaply restoring that access and getting to just about 1% connectivity, which is much better than 0% connectivity. Uh, when you're trying to get just short emergency messages over the network, you don't need to stream Netflix. You just want to get some basic text messages over the network um, with what's already built into the phone or into a PC um, uh, because the network access is actually a lot harder to restore than, than power. Uh, power, you can have generators and solar and things like that, but it's connectivity that's really been uh, the big challenge after many natural disasters. So uh, let me hand it over now to Derek to talk specifically about the Project Owl team, as well as how Code and Response helped them bring their idea to life uh, during several tests. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate that. Um, so, like Daniel mentioned, Call for Code 2018 winner Project Owl, um, they have a fantastic uh, IoT-based solution that creates a mesh network for uh, people to be able to reach out to first responders. So it's not just the open source hardware that they're using, but they actually have their own DMS, their data management system, running on IBM Cloud that they have, and, and that's kind of a, a really uh, value add to what uh, what their solution is. So not only can you take what they have um, that's open source, but they also have software that specifically is meant for people to reach out to first responders. Um, and, and I think it's a really phenomenal idea that they came up with. Um, and it, it only got better when we use the IBM service core to do this deployment. So like Daniel said, um, we have uh, the IBM service core where we get volunteers from within IBM from all over the world. Uh, we source the best talent globally from within uh, all the, the volunteers that want to want to be involved. Um, for Project Owl, we had people from um, Israel, from the UK, from Canada, from the US. So it was a very global project, and we brought those people in uh, to to Puerto Rico, where they had two weeks on the ground. There, these are some of the photos you can see in this slide, um, and basically what we did was we took Project Owl's idea, we brought in the best of the best from IBM Service Corp, and we helped them fortify their solution, their software, their hardware, uh, to, to make sure that they had the best product that they can because they wanted to test this in Puerto Rico um, after being inspired by Hurricane Maria and, and knowing that people didn't have um, you know, connectivity there. They wanted to do this and test it in the field. And that's a really cool thing about what Code and Response does. You know, we don't want to just say, you know, here's the money. Thanks. You know, it was great. Have, have fun. Right. We want to make sure that these uh, companies and these startups and these ideas can grow. Um, and really, that's that's what we did. So we we did pilot tests in Puerto Rico for um, for two weeks. We were in um, Bayamon was our uh, our hub kind of at the center of where we were at Engine 4, which was a great co-working space for us. Um, we did some pilot tests in Loisa, in San Juan, in Isabella, in Comerio. We were also in, I think, uh, Dorado, we did a few tests. Um, so it was, it was great to be able to test this in a wide variety of environments. You know, on the beach, um, in the middle of the mountains, uh, finding out what uh, impact the environment had, humidity. Uh, you know, all of these factors that were, you know, you can try to plan for them as best as you can in your head and you think about doing these tests, um, but actually being on the ground to test this stuff uh, was was phenomenal. Um, and, you know, we had some really other great partners as well, ITDRC, um, which they were instrumental in helping us uh, and Project OWL come up with, you know, the best places to test, to look at the actual radio spectrum and determine, you know, how things were working, if we were getting interference, anything like that. Um, so it, it was it was 
phenomenal to do. We also had um, some really essential partners, the University of Puerto Rico, Johnson & Johnson, um, some local government help as well in San Juan, Bayamon and Isabella. Um, and throughout the course of 2019, as we did this, um, we, we also did have a documentary about this, which is really cool. So just a slight little plug for that. If you're interested in that, take a look at our uh, Code and Response uh, documentary on Project OWL. There's some really cool behind the scenes stuff and, and just some, some great footage. You can see our progress as we did this um, in Puerto Rico. Um, we Between IBM and Project OWL, I think we were in Puerto Rico about a half a dozen times in 2019 working on this. Um, they made additional visits to uh, other parts of the island like Umacao and Mayaguez and uh, Aguadilla. Um, great places again to continue testing and further building relationships. Uh, and, and the slide here you'll see is um, where Project OWL and IBM, we engage the students from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez. And the great part about that was that we had an enthusiastic group of students that were interested in learning about, you know, leading edge technology. And so we took what we were working on with Project OWL um, and, you know, helped them understand, you know, the hardware, the software, how to set things up. We partnered with the school to actually set up these devices um, on the top of numerous buildings. Uh, and, you know, the students got to learn how, how it works. They manage the devices out there. Um, it was a really awesome, um, you know, opportunity for the students and for IBM and Project OWL. Um, and, you know, the outcome from everything that we did uh, with the Service Corps, with Code and Response, you know, we helped improve Project OWL's technical architecture and their solution. Created a con, uh, so, excuse me. Created a ton of um, connections and and valuable resources on the island of Puerto Rico with people that are always willing to um, help us, so we can help them and give back. Um, and then they've also, after working with all of us, they've continued uh, the iteration of their product and their software after the Service Corps. So it's great to see uh, Project that will grow. You know, from the winner to the. Uh, deployment and implementation, and then further continuing on as as their own company where they're killing it. So um, really, really cool opportunity with Project OWL. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Daniel to talk a little bit about our 2019 winner. Um, so Daniel. There we go. All right. Great. Um, hopefully uh, you can uh, hear me here. Um, so there was a question I saw in the chat already. Derek, maybe you can answer that. Uh, somebody was looking for a link to the Code and Response documentary on Project DAO. There's a 15 minute documentary, uh, which is the one hosted on IBM.com. And there's actually a feature length um, uh, documentary called Code and Response, which is at a higher level about the program. Uh, that's also something that's interesting to take a look at. Uh, you can find that on um, Amazon Prime. Um, as well as a few other streaming services. Okay, um, great. Looks like we got side by side, so that's good. Let me just in there. So, um, so that let's talk now about the 2019 winner. So this was the team that came through the competition last year, uh, a team named Prometeo from Spain. And uh, what was really interesting about them is that there was, um, as opposed to the Project Owl team, which was already a, a, a set of developers that knew hardware, knew IoT. Uh, what was really inspiring about Prometeo is that their team comprised of a full stack developer and a data scientist, but they also included a firefighter, a nurse, and a PhD engineer on the team. So they, they were able to come to call for code with a great application that was something that could measure the effect of certain chemicals on firefighters in the field um, and ensure that uh, incident commanders could see exactly what was going on with a set of 10 firefighters, but also track um, those, the exposure over time, with the end result being that with a, a small device with many sensors on it, you can really help make an impact right away through an open source project. And it's something that can scale beyond what it was built for in Catalonia um, to actually go uh, scale around the world to Argentina, to Australia, to Norway, to California. Uh, other places where um, folks are exposed to simil similar types of um, uh, toxins when doing controlled burns or working with uh, wildfires directly. So uh, for this one, let me hand it to Derek, uh, take audio and uh, talk a bit about um, the, the team itself and what we had done with them with a field test 
and some of what the future holds for what they're doing today. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so again, this was another phenomenal idea that came out of Call for Code uh, to be able to monitor uh, specifically wildfire firefighter health. Uh, this was a new area to me where, you know, I, I didn't realize that, you know, wildfire firefighters in particular, you know, they might be out in the field, uh, you know, handling a burn for, you know, days potentially. So they don't wear oxygen masks and carry tanks and things like that. So it's, uh, this was kind of a gap where, uh, you know, Prometeo came along and said, look, we need to watch out for these firefighters and have a device that can monitor their immediate health, um, but also have access to, um, you know, a history of their health over time. Um, and so it's, it's pretty incredible because they they had a device uh, similar to what Project Owl was, the same, you know, IoT board, um, and they were just using it a bit of a different way. But they were still monitoring, you know, smoke concentration, humidity, um, things like that. And it was incredible to see, you know, the, the passion that this team had. And again, you know, this just goes to show that Call for Code uh, is not just for developers. It's not just for technical people. Like Daniel said, you know, the one was a firefighter, one's a nurse. You know, it's great to bring people that are experts and bring them together to, to create a cohesive solution. And I think Prometeo is the epitome of that. Um, we did the prescribed burn, uh, or this field test back in February of this year, um, right before all the, the COVID stuff kind of happened. And it was incredible to see this in action because um, we got everything set up. You'll see in the photos here, we're in a, we're in a big tent that the firefighters set up for us. Um, and they did a controlled burn, got some great drone footage too. Um, and we, we were able to kind of watch them do this controlled burn, but also monitor uh, what they were doing on this wearable that they had um, that Prometeo came up with and, and saw live what was happening. The cool part about this was, and we talk about the, the importance of open source and tech for good, um, as we looked at Prometeo and what they were doing with everything, we kind of looked at it and said, hey, let's kind of involve Project Owl from last year because they have you know a year head start working with a similar device. Um, they've probably learned some really good do's and don'ts and, and learn things the hard way and have some really good uh, experience with it. So we actually asked them if they wanted to be on site for this and kind of show Project Owl uh, the art of the possible for what they do. Um, because, uh, I'm sorry, so Prometeo, the art of the possible, I apologize. Um, because Prometeo was using a Wi-Fi based technology where uh, Project Owl was using LoRa. Uh, if you're familiar with LoRa, um, it's a long range, low power Wi-Fi. Um, connectivity. And so we said, hey, why don't we take this because this will expand what Prometeo can do. We can take the expertise from what Project Owl has learned from this and integrate it together, which is exactly what we did. And um, that was really cool to see. We had two teams from two different winning years come together, work on something um, and be able to have it work live in the field. Um, and we we had a pretty simple integration process through our IBM IoT platform that made that possible, which is pretty incredible. Um, and we did some really awesome uh, long range testing of, you know, how far could these sensors work? Um, you know, we flew one up on a drone, like, you know, uh, half a mile away and uh, like a quarter mile up. And it was, it was amazing to see just how amazing this technology was and how it all um, kind of worked together. Um, and again, we involved uh, the IBM Service Corps in this project as well. Um, here's some photos from the prescribed burn. Pretty, pretty amazing time. One of the coolest things I've probably ever done in my career. Um, but the IBM Service Corps has been engaged now. We are just battling, uh, you know, the COVID-19 stuff. So right now the work is being done virtually with an on-site planned either later this year or sometime early next year to be able to do exactly what we did for Project OWL and go on-site in Catalonia and do some more prescribed burns and some testing and, and gathering firefighter feedback. Um, and, you know, the thing about open source and tech for good and, and you know, the way that these solutions can really help people is it does attract some attention. So, you know, uh, Prometeo is, is uh, exploring options with a large electronic manufacturer, um, looking into edge technologies to do some of this processing um, on 
the device instead of doing machine learning on the cloud. So there's some really, really cool stuff that kind of uh, came out of this project and just further goes to show how important it is to focus on um, tech for good and, and things like, like this through our code response program. Daniel, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Derek. Much appreciated. And uh, just to echo a key part of what Derek said, um, open source was key to uh, not only improving Project Owl solution, they, they've got a very vibrant project, uh, the Cluster Duck Protocol. If you if you see that on GitHub, I'll give you a link at the end of um, the session. Um, they had a similar platform and they could bring that that year long head start to Project Owl, uh, to Prometeo, I'm sorry, and uh, use that technology to to improve how it can be uh, built forward. And um, going forward with Prometeo, we're working with them to go to the third gen platform. Uh, we are transitioning to their, their, their repos out in the open, um, in the open source organization, uh, breaking out their version one, their version two, um, and consolidating on a version uh, three or release three, that's going to have additional sensors. So the focus for the field test was carbon monoxide, uh, but through the community, we're, we're sourcing new designs for um, seven new sensors, uh, which will include things like uh, nitrous, uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, acrolein, formaldehyde, and benzene. Uh, because these are controlled burns, they actually start them themselves. It's kind of ironic, the firefighters starting the fires. Um, but to get ahead of um, any wildfires, uh, what they do is start, and they've got a very uh, high, highly toxic accelerant with benzene in it. So um, working with those, and uh, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have a third uh, iteration of that, and uh, we'll grow the community out as well. So uh, let me shift gears a bit to this year's program um, and then uh, talk to how you can take part and maybe uh, you could become the next code and response at the Linux Foundation project um, if you place in the top five. But, you know, um, we want you to be aware of what's there, too, and invite projects into um, the Linux Foundation under this umbrella, even if they don't come through the call for code um, challenge, which is the case of one promising technology that's uh, that's going to come uh, in within the next uh, six weeks. So, um, call for code, uh, you can learn about it at this uh, URL below. That'll take you to uh, the IBM.com page where you register for the competition. Um, and then there's a, the callforcode.org site has information, the canonical rules, um, the judging criteria, the timeline, things like that. But uh, as I mentioned, um, call for code does focus on some of the world's most pressing challenges. And when we launched earlier this year, we really expanded out the um, the impact of natural disasters on humans, um, wildfires on firefighters, for example, to look at more of the systemic causes. So we launched in partnership with the United Nations who are in their 75th anniversary this year, as well as with the 10 year countdown to the sustainable development goals. Uh, we launched with a focus on climate change. And, and it's really something that uh, is such a, a powerful issue. It affects people around the world it's something that's growing. It's something where action needs to be taken immediately. So um, it's it's really something that we have to keep an eye on and, and to conceive of new solutions to it. Um, so we launched with climate change with three sub themes of uh, water sustainability, energy sustainability, and uh, disaster resiliency. But we also recognize that there was um, a growing pandemic that was a much more pressing challenge, one that was having a more immediate and visible impact on human lives. So we added a COVID-19 track to this year's Call for Code competition. Uh, it doesn't focus on vaccine development or uh, medicine research or, or uh, gene sequencing, things like that. It's really about understanding the social and business issues out there that can be improved by technology. And I'll get into some of those sub themes shortly. So um, we do have both themes. Uh, developers can create solutions for one or both tracks um, and some uh, potential solutions for uh, an immediate impact of COVID-19 may be also something that's helpful in future pandemics or also as part of um, climate change type of activities. So uh, there is a bit of overlap um, and very excited to see the solutions that come into that. So looking specifically at COVID-19, um, the focus of call for code is to bring that bridge that gap between experts on the particular issue as well as the technology that can be used by the world's 24 million developers to to actually make a difference and make sure they're solving the right problems so what we do with call for code is we call out a couple of sub uh, a set of sub themes and um, 
Uh, in, in the case of COVID-19, we, we make that abstract issue more concrete by asking developers to focus on crisis communication solutions, perhaps how to create bots for managing um, overloaded um, local resources or understaffed supermarkets that need to manage uh, in how information is shared. Uh, remote education, uh, right? So I don't know if you hear in the background here, but my son is doing tutoring in the other room over Skype. Um, so just finding ways for uh, folks like him who are lucky enough to have his own iPad, but also people who are offline, don't have access to computers. What potential solutions are there out there for students and, and their parents and their teachers? Um, and finally, community cooperation. So how do you make do in this new economic environment? How do you share resources, share information, um, really track and know the risk from the pandemic around you uh, and understand how you can make a difference um, and really, again, make that abstract down to something concrete that uh, someone can do with technology. Uh, I touched on it earlier, but um, water sustainability, energy sustainability and disaster resiliency are three key pillars uh, behind our climate change track. Uh, so understanding the impact of what someone can do, giving them information on the best way to conserve water, uh, make better decisions about how they water crops, uh, for example, based on future weather trends, Energy sustainability, so making buying decisions, tracking your own consumption, uh, making sure you're focused on the real things that are consuming power, maybe rather than things you think consume power. So uh, looking at great solutions there. And disaster resiliency, so going beyond natural disasters as in the fir first two years, but also man-made disasters, um, climate-related disasters, things like that. So both tracks uh, each have a sub-theme within. And the prize structure is uh, is very similar to what we did in in prior years. So uh, two hundred thousand dollars for the top team, twenty five thousand dollars for the two runners up, um, and then the fourth and fifth place teams get ten thousand dollars. All of them get um, some mentorship from the Linux Foundation, which can also connect them to other communities and some uh, potential funding and mentorship opportunities. And um, by joining this. Um, you'll be able to work together with folks around the world um, within the Linux Foundation, as well as um, students, um, small and large institutions uh, around the world. So really looking forward to seeing how this community grows um, and improves year over year uh, to improve the previous year's solution, but also inspire new, new innovation on top of that. So uh, just to look at the time frame for Call for Code, um, We've, uh, we launched it in February with climate change, the track there. We added an early track for COVID-19. We decided to recognize and support three projects early. Uh, so those are also projects that are um, starting to work their way into um, uh, code response with the Linux Foundation. Uh, one of them um, is, is, is a really great solution called SafeQ. Uh, maybe Derek can provide a link to that in the chat, uh, but it's one of those ones that's really having a great impact already. It's being tested in the field right now. Uh, with uh, support from Code and Response, uh, really great stuff. But you can continue to develop applications for the competition through the end of July. So you've got one uh, 30 days left. Um, judging will be done by um, experts um, from around the world. Um, uh, earlier for the, actually the, the early track, we had Mark Cuban as one of the judges. We had experts from the United Nations. We had experts from uh, local organizations, law enforcement, uh, climate change experts, disaster resiliency experts, really to take not only a view of the technology and assess that, but make sure that it's something that um, is relevant, transferable, uh, feasible, solving the right problem. So again, looking forward to, to highlighting these, these applications in October and beginning their deployments um, in 2021. Um, hopefully when we're back, uh, able to do group events and, and be on the ground. Um, actually, yep, so here were the top three, SafeQ. Um, Are You Well was another great application, um, which was a way to connect um, uh, uh, folks with uh, medical resources in their communities, focusing on the situation in India, uh, ensuring that uh, that um, location um, is not overwhelmed, its medical resources are not overwhelmed. Uh, they're already uh, experiencing quite a bit, especially in Mumbai, there's, there's a lot of um, over overloaded um, medical institutions there right now. So this solution is being um, iterated on through Altran, the team that created it, as well as with support of Anthem, a large insurance company and other partners. Uh, and COVID Impact is a, um, a way in Canada to connect small businesses with resources, grants, 
uh, and other information that may apply to them so they keep resilient through these tough times. Um, so look out for those applications. They also remain eligible for the global competition. Okay, so if you're a developer that wants to take part, um, there's four steps. Um, you accept the challenge, which is um, registering for the competition. Uh, you've got access to open source technology. Most of what's on the IBM cloud is based on open source. I think it's 80% uh, at least. So uh, if you're working on Docker locally, you're working in Kubernetes, um, you're able to take that and host that up on the cloud. Um, same with uh, OpenWhisk, uh, Knative, um, a bunch of open source platforms, open source technologies um, are, are able to run there. You can find teammates through our Slack community. As I mentioned, Slack is an affiliate. Uh, they've helped us um, uh, get a nice um, uh, community in, in there. I think there's six to 8,000 folks in there right now, all kind of collaborating and looking for teammates, working and learning about the technology, sharing information. And then finally, at the end of July, submit the idea with up to four other um, team team members, and um, and and we'll we'll, we'll rate the uh, the highest ideas that come out of there um, through the judges. Um, so we do also, as a way to bridge that abstract challenge like climate change or COVID nineteen to some some feasible use case, we have what are called starter kits. So these carve out one particular use case. Um, around that larger sub theme and give you a starting point. For example, if you want to learn how to make a bot, uh, run an offline learning platform, uh, learn what data sets are available for um, energy resiliency, things like that. Uh, there's a whole set of starter kits there. Um, they, they basically make the, the, the abstract real um, and, and give, you, give you a great um, starting point. Uh, there's also, you know, if you already know what you want to build, uh, just dive directly into using some of the, the IBM cloud services, open source data sets. Uh, we've got a list of um, things from around the world that come from um, um, from lots of different sources that you can use in your Jupyter notebooks, for example, um, and uh, connect with your you know your open hardware based systems um, using MP. Again, within the Slack channel, I see there was a question about how do you get an invitation to join the Slack channel? It's a great question. So um, if you go to callforcode.org slash Slack, uh, there's a type form that'll get you an invite. You accept the code of conduct um, and then it'll send you an email on how you can join. So there's channels for each of the, the themes and sub themes. And um, you can uh, reach out to IBM mentors in there as well as experts um, from lots of different companies like here, which is a location-based service. Um, and there's a couple of other uh, APIs and things you can learn about in there as well. And, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to create an amazing solution based on all those resources and solve the real problem, but you've got to also be able to communicate um, why your solution is different, um, what problem you're solving, how you're going to measure your impact. And given that we do have all of these um, widely skilled judges that aren't just technologists, that aren't just open source experts, but that are heads of NGOs, uh, you really want to be able to understand the issue you're solving, uh, try to speak in, in a common language that appeals to everybody that can quickly understand your idea, and then um, document it very well. Uh, there's a starting project sample that has a good skeleton repo based on some of the Linux Foundation best practices you can start with. Um, and that includes some, some tips around the video and deeper documentation. Um, but it's, it's really just like with SafeQ earlier this year, uh, the, the value of that was evident, uh, that the innovation was, was quick and amazing, just how uh, fast it came together based on a starter kit. Um, and it really hit the judges with a nice demo. Um, so that's why it was really a top solution to look at. Um, so you can um, go check out, as I said, um, uh, callforcode.org, that is the multi-year initiative page that has information about how to, um, what the competition is, the rules, the judging, the judges themselves are going to be listed there. Um, and it also has information on uh, what you need to submit, uh, the FAQ. And if you're not, you know, if you're not just a developer, but that you also want to um, perhaps join as an organization, uh, there's information there on how you can join the ecosystem, sponsorships, affiliates, um, no cost um, supporterships, things like that. And um, 
There is also a corresponding uh, Linux Foundation page that links to a couple of the projects we have right now. Um, it highlights just two right now. So the Cluster Duck protocol, uh, which is the one that came out of Project Owl. It's their open source firmware. And uh, there's also a link there to DroneAid, uh, which was another very interesting solution that came from one of the first Call for Code events we did in Puerto Rico two years ago. Uh, and this is about solving the problem where um, folks, uh, you've probably seen it in the news. I know in Houston, it was big news, Florida, Puerto Rico, but folks who are disconnected from networks, how do they express their needs um, to helicopters, to drones, to civil aviation, to satellites? They kind of put together logs that say help or you know, uh, write help in the sand sort of thing. What DroneAid does is it sets up a, a common language based on the UN OCHA uh, standard icon model um, and trains a visual recognition model that can be um, put into a drone uh, again, just take live feeds from satellites or whatever it is to identify the need expressed by somebody on the ground at a specific location um, and, uh, and speed some help to them. So a couple great projects there. There's uh, many other projects that are also in the works in the... Uh other ones are... are in, um, in various states of iteration right now. Um, uh, Liquid Prep is one that came from actually an IBM internal competition. Um, they are starting a service core deployment right now. They're connected with um, some organizations in India to test their device. It's one of these that helps uh, give farmers advice on whether they should water now based on weather forecasts. Um, and um, Isaac Simo is one based on a, a previous year winner as well. It's for assessing um, building construction quality, ensuring that people who've had improvements done to their home through an NGO, um, and particularly in Colombia, um, can prove that the work was done well um, and um, if, if they can safely go back into their, their homes. And one of the ones to keep an eye on is this uh, Open EEW, Open Earthquake Early Warning, Early Earthquake Warning System project. Uh, you'll be hearing about that one pretty soon. Um, they are they're coming to Linux Foundation as well. Uh, what they do is, uh, rather than a multi-million dollar earthquake warning system that's at the national level, uh, they smell they 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 sell a small um, uh, or create a small open source device that can that has a very highly sensitive accelerometer in it. So it scales out. Uh, where the sensing of earthquakes are, such as in Puerto Rico, where we have a few installed, um, and uh, get folks alert, uh, alerted uh, 30 seconds to a minute ahead of where they might be affected. So really promising technology, a nice portfolio of what's out there. You can contribute to them. Um, you can join the conversation. Um, but yeah, again, if you if you enter Call for Code with an idea um, and you win, you'll get uh, really some hands-on support to take your idea forward. Um, so with that, um, let's open it up to some questions. I saw some that came into the chat, and I'm not sure if Derek caught any of them. Uh, yep, so Derek provided a link to the 18-minute documentary. That's great. Um, and he's got a link to ClusterDuck, right? So they've got their solution. They've got how you can assemble one of these devices. Uh, they're continuing to add additional device support. They started with the ESP32 board. I think it was a Helltech. Um, I don't remember, it wasn't 100% reliable, so they're always looking for different platforms. Uh, so the community has been able to help them be more um, uh, abstracted from the specific implementation. If you have any hardware expertise, go check it out. Uh, try to set it up yourself um, and contribute to it in other ways. You can build an ecosystem of other um, uh, things around that to, to kind of help visualize where the information comes from. Um, Yep. All right, so Derek's got safe queue in there. Uh, we talked a bit about Slack. Uh, sounds like we've got that one um, handled as well. Okay. Um, if you have any other questions, drop them in the chat. Okay. Let's see. All right. Yeah, it's interesting. The question David, there was a question there about a copy of the uh, presentation, which I think. Uh... Yes, I do have that actually. That's always the yeah. first question I get. So I already put it up on SlideShare. So let me actually ping that in. Yeah. 
in the Q&A. Okay. So anything that you want to send to them will go to the Slack channel. Okay. Oh, I see. There's, um, yep, you have a chat there. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. I can post them in the Slack channel, but if you go to um, slideshare.net slash Daniel Crook, my full name, uh, you'll see the slide deck is updated there. Um, and, um, okay, there we go. So the, the channel is, um, uh, if you're in uh, the OSS Slack, to track open source project updates. Okay. And again, to join Slack, it was callforcode.org slash Slack. And, um, and also Daniel, github.com. Go ahead, Derek. So I think there's like a substantial lag here. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, one of the other questions in here just says, uh, if you enter the chair, not a winner, can you enter again in a subsequent year? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, yes, you can do that. So um, the theme might change every year. So a solution that you might build for this year might need to be adjusted for the following year. It could be something completely different. Um, but yes, you can do that. And additionally, um, we made it so that, you know, if you're doing any other hackathons or events like that, you're able to take your solutions that you're creating for Call for Code and use them um, elsewhere as well. Okay. And I um, should mention too, there is a fresh code rule. So whatever you do submit um, should be fresh for the new competition, but it can build on anything that was open sourced and available to anybody else um, at the start of the competition. So uh, if you've got node module dependencies, if you have data sets, if you have your own code, or if you're building on a previous year's winners, um, you know, those are all fair game to build upon. Um, but uh, you, your code's got to be substantially new. It can't be a project uh, that you created privately last year. Um, you know, a whole new thing that you, know, you just submit. It's, it's got to be a, a new idea or a new set of code that you're, you're submitting. Um, and as you submit, uh, since the goal is to create sustainable open source projects, um, uh, we ask all winners you know, as a condition of accepting the prize, they Apache to license their, um, their projects. Um, and they can form business models around them as OWL and Prometeo have. Um, but, but yeah, you make your code available through the, through the program. Okay, great. I think that's it for the questions. Um, so again, for follow-ups, um, so if you go to uh, github.com slash code and response, um, you can find the repos. Um, and then um, in the Slack channel, there's actually two, sorry, two Slack workspaces. One is the Golf Code one, which is golfcode.org slash Slack, but the Open Source Summit Slack also has its own channel. Uh, we'll put the slides into both areas um, so that you'll have those. Great, and with that, um, I think we're all set here. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, look forward to seeing some of your applications. If you could participate in Call for Code this year, um, or even those issues open, the pull request sent to some of the code response repos already.